it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The good die badly. Oh, I hate this case. I hate it with every fiber of my being. I thought it was done and buried. Now I'm back here at the crime scene, waiting in my car for the alcohol and Vicodin to kick in, sending a goodbye text to my wife and grown child. I look into the dark shadows of the abandoned building, and I know. I know in my deepest heart of hearts, I'm going to die in there. Once I feel the joints stop hurting, my chest stop burning and my vision blurred at the edges, I step out into the street. The rusty doors on my old Buick squeal in protest. The old abandoned St. Emily's. Been abandoned for ten years now. They built a new one on the exit to the freeway. Its glowing billboard offered quick, caring service. Health with hospitality was the new hospital slogan. But not this one. No, this wretched building had witnessed the deaths of hundreds over the years. The building had been home to the most vile scene of torture and madness to hit the state within the last five years. As I walked up to the entrance, chained shut with a padlock, I wondered if the building was evil, or if it only attracted evil. One thing was for sure. Evil was here tonight. I fished in my coat pocket for a key, hoping it would still be the same one from five years ago. It took a little bit of work, but finally the padlock popped open. I walked into the dark hallway next to the stairway. This entrance used to be an entrance for employees only, but I knew it well, and I knew I had to get to the eighth floor. As I climbed the stairs, my mind raced back to five years ago. I just started my PI business back then. It was my first big case after my early retirement. My old partner threw me the lead. Four girls had gone missing in the city within the last four months. The last girl was 19-year-old Vivian Strop. Disappeared after taking a night class at the local community college. The case was closed when major crimes caught the suspected murderer. A human stain named Jeremy Whitmore. Jeremy was caught after he tried to abduct another woman. This woman pepper sprayed him and stabbed him through the cheek with her car keys. <laughs> Good for her. Jeremy was tracked down the next day and dogpiled by SWAT. In his interrogation, he admitted to the abductions of the girls. Oh, twenty of them. Yep, that's right. Twenty. There's no way he did all of that. He was literally borderline retarded and three of the four girls were taken within walking distance of his apartment. He prayed off the college down the road, but not the college Vivian was taken from. She was taken from a college forty minutes away. It wouldn't be the first time a serial killer exaggerated their numbers. Once they realized the jig was up, they wanted Charlie Manson fame. He claimed to have murdered a girl every night, would start ranting and preaching when pushed on the details and logistic of his kills. Oh, the mayor's office put a lot of pressure on the PD to close the case. Jeremy was slowly giving out details on where he hid the bodies. He'd eventually get to Vivian, right? Well, my former partner Rob called bullshit on this. He said he was in the interrogation room with a dipshit fed asking questions. Rob said the fed led Jeremy in the questioning to connect him to Vivian. Of course Jeremy knew of the college Vivian was taken from. He'd lived in the town all his life. But that's not the worst of it. There was a voicemail from the night Vivian disappeared. She'd called her brother who was at home waiting on her. She said she was walking to her car and wanted him to stay on the phone with her until she made it. She'd said they were following her. She then screamed, Adam, David, Ed, before the call cut out. You see, Vivian's uncle was a cop back in the day. Adam David Edward is police alphabet for A-D-E. Vivian was reading off a license plate, just like her cop uncle taught her before somebody grabbed her. Now, Jeremy didn't have a car, didn't even have a license. He was an idiot that killed in his own backyard, so needless to say, Vivian's family didn't believe Jeremy was her killer, and there was hope she was still alive. 
Vivian's uncle wanted to come out of retirement and start knocking down doors looking for her in my city. Of course, Rob caught wind of this and talked him down. He pointed the uncle in my direction, and I took the job at a deep discount. They could pay me in full if I found the girl in one piece. Oh, she'd been gone for four days. I had to work fast. My first stop was the college she went missing from. The useless campus cops were no help to Rob in his investigation, so I talked with a student safety patrol that were the real eyes and ears. A nervous Indian student told me he and his co-workers had been getting more and more calls to escort girls through the parking lot at night. He told me they had called Campus PD on a beat-up suburban idling across the street at the closed McDonald's. He told me they would called Campus PD on a beat-up suburban idling across the street at the closed McDonald's. He even saw it two nights ago. Well, Campus PD told Safety Patrol it wasn't against the law to sit in the parking lot at a McDonald's. And technically the McDonald's wasn't even in their jurisdiction. God, useless. Well, I had no further lead. I doubted the Mickey D's had cameras. So I did what all great PIs do. I went on a stakeout at the campus parking lot. My Indian friend agreed to keep it a secret when I showed him my credentials and slipped him a hundred for two nights. As I sat in my darked-out car with the engine off and windows cracked, I fought boredom and the urge not to drink my soda. Too much would make me need to piss and blow my cover. Maybe another twenty in Avi would let me sneak into a building to handle my business. Now, oh, I'm not a dirty old man, but I can admire a gorgeous woman when I see one. Also, I was trying to think like the bad guy, so when a curvy redhead parked at the back of the parking lot nearest to the McDonald's across the street, I perked up. I was parked a few rows in front of her, using my rearview mirror to spy on her, and I got a better look as she walked by me towards campus. She was on her phone and distracted, hands full of books and a purse and keychain. She'd driven a little CRV with manual lock. Walking fast and not aware of her surroundings, she passed right by me and never saw me sitting low in my car. Oof, jackpot, I thought. She was easy prey. Oh, I hoped her class wasn't too long. If anything, I could watch her and make sure she made it to her car safely when it was over. But that's when I saw movement by her car. Someone was leaning against the passenger side door. I could barely see anything in the rearview mirror so I quietly opened my door and ducked out between the vehicles. I got a few rows closer to him. Now I was a big guy, so sneaking around was hard on my knees. The guy wore a hoodie and fumbled with the door for a good amount of time. Not a master criminal, I presume. Finally I heard the door click unlocked. He opened it to unlock the back door and jumped in to lie down. I could have taken him right when he was at the door, but but it would only have been criminal trespass or burglary of a vehicle, at most. A lowly Class B. No, I wanted him dead to rights. I'd wait till the redhead returned. Red's class was an hour. The whole time my adrenaline was spiking. I knew what was coming was going to be bad. I could always tell. My arms would feel heavy and I'd get cold inside. My mind would focus to a sharp point. I hadn't started drinking heavily then, but this case pushed me to it. I took a couple of swigs from my flask. Finally, Red appeared, walking and talking on her phone. She looked and sounded tired. As she approached her vehicle, I walked up loudly behind her. I waited for her to unlock the doors with a remote. Ma'am, excuse me. I'm working with the police. Please hang up your phone and call them right now. I pulled my Army Issue Colt 45 from my jacket, a retirement gift. Had my name on it and everything. Hoped it would only ever be used for show. The silver gleam of it caused her eyes to widen. What? She stammered. Stand back. There is someone in your back seat. I said as I leveled the pistol at the car. She did, and I announced loudly, Get out, shithead. Let me see your hands. There was a moment of silence. Then the car started rocking and I could hear banging on the door. Red whimpered and ran to hide behind another car. All I heard was, Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, as she fled. 
The back door kicked open and I heard a snort and a cough from within. A man sat up and started squirming out feet first. He was draped in the shadows, but I could see he was tall and lanky. He stood up to face me. Both his hands had bloody bandages wrapped around them. He pulled back his hood to show me a toothless grin and a pus-filled missing eye. I took a step back in horror. His face was covered with sores and cuts. He was missing a left ear, and he smelled like decay. Get on the ground now, I commanded. He snorted and spat at me. Catch it. Pervert with purple eyes. I see you. I see you, Mr. Squiggles. I knew this was meth speak, so I reiterated my position. I'm not a cop, brother. I will stack this clip in your face and claim self-defense. And he lunged at me. He almost fell to the ground by tripping over himself. My shot rang out and busted the window behind him. He shot back up and grabbed a hold of my weapon with both hands. We both wrestled over it. One of us must have hit the button to eject the mag. It clattered across the floor. Damn, only one round in the chamber now, and he had crazy meth strength. The Lord does not die tonight, Squiggles, he screamed at me with his rancid hot breath. He was going to kill my out-of-shape ass with my own gun. I angled the gun towards the ground and fired the last shot to ricochet across the asphalt. The slide rocked back to show it was empty. I then released our fight over it. The idiot pointed the obviously empty gun in my face and tried to shoot me. Then I slammed the meth head with a heavy right hook. He flew back to crack his head against the driver's side window. And I huffed over to him and flipped him on his stomach and sat my fat ass on his ass. He was okay. He was screaming obscenities and made up Bible verses at me when Campus PD arrived. All rolling up like super cops, screaming and pointing guns at me. They even put me in cuffs. Finally, Rob showed up with the real PD. Campus police asked for help when I mentioned it was connected to an ongoing city case. He had them take me out with a cuff too. Rob, this guy knows where Vivian is. Get me a lead and I'll get to her. I can cut through all the red tape, I stammered to him. Whoa, slow up. Do you think this guy has a coherent thought in his head? Rob asked as the campus cops threatened to tase him in the back seat of the patrol car if he didn't stop trying to kick out the windows. A mixture of slobber and blood smeared all over the glass from headbutting the window. Get me a criminal history and background check. We for sure know he wasn't the brains of the operation. Oh, maybe I can find an accomplice, I answered. Rob shook the idea around in his head. Sounds good. You always were a crap magnet on my shift. Well, let's hope it helps you find these turrets. All right, I said. Keep me in the loop. I'm going to run home and wash his stink off me. I turned to leave. <clears throat> Rob coughed. Uh, you forgetting something? He said, pointing his finger at my gun. You discharged two rounds at the scene of an attempted kidnapping. I slumped my shoulders and leaned in close. Come on, Rob. It's not your case. These guys overlooked taking it from me. Well, besides, I may need it soon if you get me that hot tip. Rob gave me a look like a disapproving parent to his child, even though I had four years on him. I don't know. I told Campus PD I'll be in tomorrow to give them a witness statement. I'll return it then. All right, you better. Don't get one of these rookies in trouble by taking advantage of their lack of knowledge. We were once there too, remember? Rob chastised. Uh, all right, boss man. I'll play nice. Just run his background quick. I said, giving him a wave as I left. I'd gotten home and taken a shower. I tried to abstain from the drink, but, but my knees were barking and waiting around made me nervous. Five tramadol and a shot of the good vodka I kept in my freezer made me right. Well, back in those days, I used the excuse that I needed it to be on top of my game to keep me alive in the field. So what if I was a little intoxicated? Being in pain was worse, right? My phone rang around midnight. It was Rob. William Kinsmith. Age 28. Used to be a janitor at the old St. Emily's. 
been on the street since it closed. But oh, it gets better. He owns a 94 model Suburban with license plate ADE5076. Oh, this is our guy, or at least the driver of the vehicle used in the abduction. I sat back, already grabbing my keys and coat. Where do you need me? What's his address? We're executing a search warrant in the morning. I've already sent a uni by his house. No suburban. But I need you to check the hospital. We know he wasn't the brain, so he may be stashed off site. Rob paused. Oh, and he had keys. Tons of them on a big chain. Not enough for probable cause, but enough for reasonable freaking suspicion. I considered this carefully. It made sense. He may still have old keys to the place he used to work. And it would be hard to get a search warrant for an entire hospital without further evidence. I needed to get in there fast. Vivian was on a ticking clock. It's almost like old times working homicide with Rob again. When I pulled up on St. Emily's, it was almost 1am. The eight-story tall block building loomed like a dark giant in the sky dominated the skyline over the short buildings around it. Most were relocated private practice doctor's offices and unused parking garages, so it was quiet and empty. I pulled up to the new chain-link fence and padlock. I snapped the padlock with some trusty bolt cutters, an essential tool for PIs. And I'd take the criminal trespass charge if it meant saving the girl. All the entrances were chained shut, I found a low window already partially shattered. I cleared the rest of the glass out with my giant mag light, and in I went into the administrative wing. I had no idea where to begin my search. Hopefully my bad luck would put me in the path of the bad guys, so I made my way to the stairwell. At least I could find a sign indicating what floor was what. Once I entered the dark stairwell, I did find a dusty map mounted on the wall. I brushed off the dust and lit it up with my light. If I was a bad guy, I'd take the victim somewhere they couldn't be heard and couldn't escape. A basement, maybe. Well, the hospital had two of them. My heart almost gave out as I heard a banshee scream echoing down the stairway from far above. The yell bounced off the walls, making it seem like a choir of copycats. I couldn't make it out to be male or female. It was just loud, shrill and in a lot of pain. I guess the bad guys chose the top floor. I looked at the map to see the top floor was the pediatric wing. Great. What's the deal with sickos and children? As I made my way up the stairs, I took care to pace myself. What good would I be if I had no energy to face whoever was up there? As I reached the sixth floor, I turned on my light sporadically, not wanting to catch the attention of anybody that could be somewhere in the stairway with me. As my light revealed my ascent to the top, it also chronicled a descent into madness. The walls were now covered with your standard curse words, pentagrams and phallic imagery. But more and more I was seeing a badly drawn stick man with two purple dots for eyes, over and over. Some of chalk, most drawn with runny spray paint by unsteady hands, but, but all had the telltale purple dots for eyes. By the time I was halfway between the 7th and 8th floor, the walls were covered with the wavy lines of the stick man. They stacked on top of each other like an army, or a silent crowd watching my climb. Another set of words ran together underneath the stick man in an uneven hand. Mr. Squiggles, Mr. Squiggles, Mr. Squiggles, over and over. He wants pain, he wants sweets, he wants pain, he wants meat. It rambled on and on, all over the stairs, the tops and bottoms, hard to reach angles. I kept my light off as I reached the platform for the eighth floor. Moonlight poured in from the windows and the orange flicker of propane lanterns dotted further down the hallway. I slowly made my way down the hallway. I had to make my way past too many open doors as I approached the nurse's station. I could imagine another methed-out freak charging from the dark, open mouths of these rooms at any instant. Cartoon paintings of happy children, animals, and airplanes decorated the walls. 
Uh, the creepy factor was off the charts, and the grip on my gun was getting sweaty from the strain I was putting on it. The nurse's station had a glowing lamp atop it, and I made the corner to see a man sitting on the floor with his back slumped against the counter. I approached the man to see, I kid you not, a power drill sticking into his head. Fresh blood leaked out of the wound. Well, at least I'd solved the mystery of who was screaming earlier. He had blood matted dreadlocks and dirty nurse's scrubs. Both his ears were missing, fingers too. Well, I'd seen this before with Meth Head Will in the parking lot. He had a lanyard around his neck. As I bent down to retrieve it, his eyes popped open and he grabbed my hand. Who are you? He said in a sing-song voice. I put my pistol in his face and was about to threaten him before his hand dropped, and he went back to being dead quiet. My fear froze me. I was sure he was dead before I got to him. He had that unnatural stillness of a corpse, something I've seen many times. How does a man look you right in the eye and question you with a sparkle in his own, and then just flip back to being dead? My reverie was broken by a frantic male voice further down the hallway. I killed the nurse, and Will hasn't come back with anyone new for you. It's over. Just let me kill the girl and kill myself. She's had enough. I quickly ducked behind the nurse's desk. I peeked over to see a tall, shirtless, pale man walking down the hallway, hands on his head and pacing back and forth. I don't want to keep the girl alive. Let me finish her. Enough with your sick games, the man argued to no one. Oh, she's still alive. She has to be here. I snuck out from behind the desk and quickly approached the man while his back was turned. He quickly turned to face me as I was upon him. I bashed him right in the forehead with the butt of my pistol. He dropped to his knees and I held him tight by the neck. Where's the girl? I screamed. Now facing me, I got a good look at his ugly mug. His eyes were bloodshot and infected from tiny cuts under his eyes. His cheek on the right side of his mouth was hanging off like a piece of ham, showing a skeletal smile underneath. If they did this to themselves, then what did they do to the girl? Pushed the barrel of the gun in his cheek wound. He screamed and I screamed back. Vivian Straub, where the hell is she? I'll pick you apart until you answer me. I fired off two shots above him and placed the hot barrel on his temple. Well, this made the tweaker mad. With an unnatural strength, he stood up and picked me up by the throat with one arm. His offhand slapped my pistol out of my hand to crash somewhere behind me. My back was slammed against the corner of the high counter of the desk, and the disfigured man leaned in to look at me. I struggled to push him off, to no effect. He pulled a rusty scalpel out of his pocket and began inching it closer and closer to my eye, a half-smile forming on the undamaged side of his face. The scalpel was only an inch away from my eye before he blinked at me and stopped. He released my neck to grab the chain from around it, pulling out my shiny P.I. badge. Are you a cop? He asks in a small voice, holding the badge out like a pendulum before his eyes. Yes, for years. Back up is coming. You should run while you can, I persuaded. He looked back at me. I was a cop once, a deputy, he said sadly before letting out a growl and gritting his teeth, like he was fighting something. Room 824, he blurted out at me before running the scalpel across his neck blood gushing quickly. He released me and fell back to the wall, quickly sliding down and dying. I stared at him for only a moment, glad for the mercy. Room 824 was urgent on my mind. I found the room quickly, knocking the door open and stepping inside. On the gurneys was a small female, handcuffed to the railing, her face covered completely in bloody bandages. Vivian! I shouted. She stirred and began screaming, believing me to be one of the psychos that had abducted her. I hurried to her and prayed that the cuffs take a police-issued key. They did, and I picked her frail body up. She screamed and swatted at me. 
I told her I'm with her family as I rush her down the stairs. Her hands are bandaged up too, and she's bleeding from somewhere. I got her outside, about to have a heart attack, as I fumbled to call 911. When EMS arrived, they had to give me oxygen too. Rob showed up with half a dozen unis and ran straight back to the back of the ambulance where I was sat. Oh, you got her back, you got her back, you beautiful bastard, he cheered. After all the dead girls he'd seen in the past few months, every victory was precious. I reached out weakly to give him a knuckle bump. Hours later, back at the real hospital, I sat in the waiting room. Ron came out to catch me up on the story he'd placed together so far. She's stable, but they did a number on her. Oof, cut up her face, pulled nails, cut off segments of her fingers. He let out a very world-weary sign. Oh, they cut off her tongue to keep her quiet. But it didn't, you know that. It just kept her from begging. And I wonder what kind of sadist doesn't like begging from their victim. Will she ever be the same? I said, looking down at my lap. The guy you sat on at the campus fessed up to three of them grabbing her. He said he was looking for a new victim to keep Mr. Squiggles from eating them. Rob said with a question on his face. I sat there thinking over the crazy night, wanting to know more. I went to go back and poke around before CSI cleaned up. I had an idea. Oh, damn, Rob. I dropped my gun. He looked at me like, so what? But I shut it off and put it in the suspect's mouth, I whispered. It'll raise questions on the ethics I use during my investigation when CSI finds it. Also, think of the poor campus cop who didn't take it from me when he should have. Oh, God, all right, Rob said as he fished out a key from his pocket. The company that owns the building gave me a key. He held it out. Don't keep it. Early morning, around 5 a.m., I rode up to the abandoned hospital. Another three tramadol, BC powder, and a Red Bull. I hadn't graduated to Vicodin just yet, but you see the progression. This time I walked in the front door. A giant white display faced me. It used to be the welcome and information sign, but it's now blank. When I got upstairs, CSI had already taped it off and removed the bodies. The new shift must have been coming in an hour. They had a patrol vehicle stationed outside. Robert told him to let me in to take pictures for my own report. I quickly located my shiny pistol. It had fallen right in a wastebasket. CSI for sure would have found it today. I snipped around a little more, only finding food wrappers and plastic sacks filled with human waste. They must have been living here for months. I walked into one room to see two electric lanterns still on, low and losing battery. On the wall, a tapestry of cartoon animals and smiling doctors and nurses. In the middle was the biggest drawing of a squiggly stick figure with purple dots for eyes. About six feet tall. Bloody handprints smeared around it to form a macabre halo. Lying on the floor around it were all sorts of bloody tools and knives. I saw a Bible with a bloody knife through it. Its pages stuck together with something awful. As I bent down to look at it, I saw a motion in the corner of my eye, where the squiggle man stood. How do I describe it? It was like when a character in a video game glitches into an object, or spider convulsions its legs before it dies. More like a spider convulses its legs before it dies. It was only for an instant, but the stick man spasmed and twitched violently. When my head jerked back up, it was still, back where it should have been. But I swear the two dots were further down on its head, looking down at me. This was enough for me. I'd been up for over twenty hours. I had all sorts of chemicals in my system, and I'd witnessed some traumatic crap that probably would give me nightmares for years. I needed to go home. I made the trek down the stairs and through the main lobby. I came to the front door and stopped to fish the key out of my pocket. And that's when I heard it. The voice that's haunted my dreams for the past five years. 
It was as if a professional voice actor was doing a Mickey Mouse impersonation, but more shrill and more filled with malevolence. Or the voice of the clown from the new Stephen King movie, but with more pitch in a teasing sing-song voice. Who are you? I spun with my gun out. The voice pulled at something deep in my monkey brain. It told me I was in the presence of a predator. I saw nobody anywhere in the dark, but one thing did immediately catch my eye. On a giant white display was a large drawing of a squiggly stick figure with two purple eyes. It was around five feet tall and had one hand up, as if waving goodbye. Well, I got the hell out of there. I swore to myself I would never go back. Whatever was haunting this hospital was outside the all-seeing view of God. It felt cold and evil. I just somehow knew. But now, five years later almost to the day, I'm back. And I know what's up there. Waving for me to come in. Like the wolf tempting Red Riding Hood to put her head in its mouth. It's waiting for me to finish what we started. Part 2 The events from five years ago were life-changing to me, and especially young Vivian. It took her weeks to recover physically, and she never quite recovered mentally. Those creeps had cut off segments of four of her fingers, two on each hand. They'd stabbed her in a non-fatal spot in the belly, and left it to get infected. They burned her body with cigarettes and used a blowtorch on her left foot. Worst of all, they had cut out her tongue. It was some sort of game for them. One of them, Julian Arnaud, used his knowledge as a nurse to keep her from dying. He also used drugs to keep her from passing from the pain, some sort of mixture of adrenaline and cocaine. Parking lot Will had indeed been on the lookout for a new victim when I caught him. Another sacrifice for Mr. Squiggles a thing they all worshipped vehemently. And last of all was Carter Regals. He was the ringleader of the group. Through investigation I found out Carter used to work for the local PD back in the day. He started as a dispatcher before making the jump to patrol. Seems he was a deputy somewhere in East Texas before all of that. I found FTOs and officers that had worked with Carter. All reports say he was a good cop. But he was jumpy and refused to work night shift. He only made it two years before resigning for uh, personal issues. Somewhere in those two years he'd worked an extra job at St. Emily's when it was operational. Before that, Carter was a deputy in East Texas. I tracked down an ex-girlfriend who said he quit after saving a girl from being killed in the woods one night. The woman was left in a vegetative state for a while, and Carter developed an unnatural fear of the dark. He'd complain of nightmares of monsters with purple eyes. Hmm, sounds familiar. So we got a nurse, a janitor and a cop who all worked at the same hospital at the same time. Oh, I'd love to know where and how they bonded in their shared lunacy. Or how Mr. Squiggles infected them all. I could go ask old parking lot Will, but well, he killed himself in his cell shortly after being arrested. He used to shift to hurry carry himself like a dishonoured samurai. Hell of a painful way to go. I'm glad he chose that method. Vivian went on to gain, actually, some semblance of life. Heavy sessions of physical therapy and mental therapy helped. She had a great support system with her parents, new kid sister, friends and me. I visited Vivian three times a week at first. Now it's at least twice a month. I became a close friend of the family. You see, I changed too that night. My soul had been bonded with Vivian's, or fates, intertwined. I made sure my presence wasn't detrimental to her frail psyche. I asked a therapist if I'd only re-victimise her just by visiting, but the therapist told me it was good for me to be by Vivian's side, as long as I showed great interest in her life before the incident. I was a new friend made on the worst day of her life. 
I pushed her to remember her life before the incident, before she was shattered. I learned sign language for her, learned about indie rock and the fundamentals of drawing to learn with her. I even sat down to watch Full Metal Alchemist and even learned its difference from brotherhood. Uh, the truth is, I was closer to Vivian than my actual daughter. Me and my daughter were good now, but I was a bad father to her in her teenage years, and maybe this was my penance for being such a terrible dad. It took Viv two years to open up to anyone. Countless surgeries, therapy sessions, and skin grafts later. And when she did, I understood why she'd never wanted to speak of any of it. She spoke of the torture for five days being roughly put back together by the nurse, just to be cut open again. She spoke of their manic screaming and ranting, all three of them constantly talking to Mr. Squiggles. Even stranger, she spoke of the ex-deputy, Carter. He would show moments of kindness and lucidity, giving her water, giving her pain medicine, always to be punished by hurting himself and apologising to Mr. Squiggles. Vivian said Carter refused to let the other two hurt her any more on the fourth day. Instead, they began hurting each other, cutting off their fingers and ears and anything to appease Mr. Squiggle. Janitor Will said he'd had enough and was going to get a new victim for Mr. Squiggles to sate his wrath. Well, of course, you know I caught him in his attempt. After Will left, Carter killed the nurse, Julian. Carter's plan was to let Vivian die so she wouldn't have to suffer any more. I like to think when I showed up, he had a change of heart and saw she could be rescued. And that's why he fought Mr. Squiggles and killed himself. Yes, I fully believe in the monster. Of course, I don't tell that to Vivian. To her, it was just shared psychosis brought on by drug abuse between her captors. Carter was like a mini-cult leader, feeding their drug addled brains tales of the boogeyman. But I know what I heard and saw that night. Something evil occupied the shadows of St. Emily's, and I would have been fine with leaving the demon there to never be thought of again, but Vivian started having nightmares. Nightmares of a dark figure with purple eyes. She said it spoke to her, told her to hurt herself and others. She believed it was a manifestation of her trauma, but I knew better. And the voice was only getting stronger. Internet searches on paranormal figures are a crapshoot. With so many creepy pastors trying to come across as real, it's hard to separate fantasy from fiction. I had to track down an actual practitioner of black magic, not some Zach Bagans cable show ghost expert. So, enter Madame Monreau of New Orleans. Made contract with her by email and vetted her with some of my NOLA cop buddies. She was legit. Scary legit. Even the cops knew to show Madame Monroe respect in their neighbourhood. I had to drop a grand just to see her, but what she told me was worth every penny. I ducked into a voodoo tourist trap off a side road from Bourbon Street. It was a store meant to trick the tourists into believing they'd found the legit voodoo shop. I gave a passcode to the clerk, and he led me out the back, through turns in an alley and up the side stairs of a brick building. Inside the building was a spacious studio apartment, white marble floor, black leather furniture, and a giant flat screen and entertainment system. The air was a chilly 60 degrees in contrast to the high 90s outside. I was left alone for only a second when Madame Monreau walked in from a back room. She was a statuesque black woman with a soft red velvet dress, many necklaces and long shiny braid pulled back into a long ponytail to hang to her lower back. She motioned to two tall back chairs facing one another for me to sit. Once we had, I thanked her for the meeting. She just stared at me with her piercing brown eyes, just enough crow's feet to make her look slightly cruel. Finally, she barked out a laugh. <laughs> you didn't expect digs like this, did you? Maybe you expected a shack by the bayou with chicken bones for wind chimes. No, ma'am, I didn't, I replied. Oh, hush, dear. You can call me Matilda. 
We are partners in this here mystery, she said with a hint of Cajun accent flavoured in her purring voice. To tell you the truth, I was thinking of scamming an out-of-town ex-cop like you, but then you mentioned purple eyes. She pulled out a Swisser sweet from her small handbag and lit it. Now we must work together. A strong scent of marijuana hit me. Oh, the good stuff. I laughed and said, I'm glad I've earned your attention. Also, my cop days are long behind me. I held out my hand to partake from her smoke. Matilda raised an eyebrow, amused. She handed me the joint and spoke. Yes, I see a lot of darkness in you now. But I also see a light that refuses to give up. What's her name? Matilda snapped in the air as if trying to conjure a memory. Your honey child. Ah, Vivian, that's it. Silky lines of smoke ran circles between us as I handed the joint back. I never told her Vivian's name, but, but I still wasn't sure I wasn't being scammed. Ah, purple eyes, she said, taking a deep drag and almost finishing it. I know of this one, and it's not pretty. She dropped the butt on the white, immaculate floor and gave me a solemn stare. The devil isn't in hell, you know. He roams to and fro, seeking who he may devour. He and his fallen angels will only be thrown to hell on the day of judgment. She tilted her head on a quizzical nature. So if the devil isn't down there punishing sinners with a pitchfork, then who is Shay? Purple eyes, I stated as a half-question. Yes, it is a thing of hell, a torturer, a weapon. It has no conscience or reasoning on why it does what it does. Its base drive is to punish, to inflict pain. It's as if a piece of hell itself exists on this material plane. Oh, great. An uber demon, I smirked. I thought I'd just throw some holy water at it and be done with it. Matilda didn't share in my humor. Her stone-cold stare only hardened. The weed was doing nothing to lighten her mood. It is a devourer of demons. It's a thing demons and angels fear. It's used as a warning to show angels what the price of disobedience will get them. Although created by God, it's not a thing of God. It is a thing made separate. A thing unseen by his all-seeing eye. So, how do I stop it, or exercise or whatever it's still hurting vivian it's changing her i spoke with exasperation this was all too much somehow i knew what matilda was saying was gospel i'd felt as much when i was in the hospital that night ah my family tells me a story about purple eyes a story even legend among beings of the higher and lower planes a brash, arrogant angel summoned purple eyes from the depths to take revenge on a traitorous demon. To take the demon to hell before the day of judgment. But purple eyes has no aster. and does not recognize the difference between angel and demon. It only knows to punish. So it absorbed the arrogant angel and went on to absorb many other spiritual entities. So, um, it can eat ghosts, I said trying to keep my mind open. If she was making it up, then she was a great storyteller. It is a prison for all things spiritual. It takes on the traits and knowledge of those it absorbs, Matilda warned. It is most attracted to innocence and free will sacrifice. Those things are non-existent in the void of hell. Well, I left Madame Runrose another three grand lighter. She swore to me she'd find a weakness or spell to use against the torture of hell. I would have gladly dropped more money if it increased my chance of saving Vivian by the smallest chance. But Vivian was fallen deeper into his thrall. On one of my frequent visits, I was sitting across from her, drawing in my pad, while she drew in hers, while listening to Death Cab for Cutie. She tapped her pad with a pencil to get my attention to look up. She held up her picture. I let out a verbal groan. I told her not to dwell on her nightmares to a psychiatrist, but she only shared them with me. It was another beautifully drawn picture of something terrible. 
depicted in her slightly anime-inspired caricature of a horrible event with purple eyes as the main focus. This one showed a small boy with a bald head, eyes closed and crying as a black shadow loomed over him, its purple eyes blazing. Why do you show me these? I sighed to her. Her beautiful face was sullen. The plastic surgeon had done wonders on her, but you could still see shallow veins of scarring. It won't stop bugging me till I show you, she sighed back. I think it wants you to know. Look, you can't listen to it, Vivian, I said aloud, causing birds feeding in the backyard to take flight. We were sitting on the back porch of her parents' house during a beautiful sunny day. Now all that was ruined. Vivian gave me a dour look and sighed indignantly. It's part of my process. It's part of my recovery. But I knew it wasn't. She believed purple eyes is a figment of the angst and torment on her mind. But I knew the truth. Her first pictures were of a human figure of pure light with brilliant magenta-coloured eyes being swallowed by a wave of darkness. The angel from the legend. The angel of light an expression of pure agony on its face. Then she drew a follow-up picture of the shadow, now formed like a man with its signature purple eyes. Then there were the pictures of her kidnappers, one of the cops standing in the rain across from a man as a woman hung from a tree between them, another of a nurse with dreadlocks cutting his face as the shadow loomed over him. And the last of the three... A picture of a janitor praying in a maintenance closet to two purple lights at a makeshift altar. I knew these were scenes of the torturer's life. It was showing them to Vivian, who would then show them to me. It was taunting me. And this last picture, I knew what it was about. It was the torturer's first meeting with Mr. Squiggles. I had been thorough in my investigation after the incident all those years ago. I tracked down a retired nurse who used to work on the 8th floor pediatric wing. Kiki Rawlins worked 15 years at Old St. Emily's on the 8th floor. On the pretense of collecting ghost stories for a novel, she divulged to me the rumours around pediatrics' resident friendly ghost, Mr. Squiggles. Kiki told me that Mr. Squiggles' story had been around since before she'd worked there. Children would tell about dreams of a bald-headed kid standing beside their bed at night. The boy would always show the patient a picture of a stick figure. That's you and me, the boy would say, pointing to the stick man. I'm Mr. Squiggles, and you are Mrs. Squiggles, <laughs> the boy would laugh. If he was talking to another boy, it would be Mr. Scribbles and Mr. Squiggles, respectively. Kiki said the children would always have this vision days before passing. It was always a comforting dream. Things among the nurses would go missing, or be misplaced. It was always blamed on the antics of Mr. Squiggles. He was just part of the job. Another thing to accept during the nurse's day-to-day -day routine. But then Mr. Squiggles changed. Around the time Carter Eagles began working extra jobs on the first floor. Children had nightmares of Mr. Squiggles. He would pull at them and tell them only hell awaited them. The mortality rate on the floor went up 40% in the four months before the hospital closed. Kiki said nurse didn't feel good walking into rooms with the lights on. It always felt like something was waiting to pounce out and hurt you. So that's how I knew the pictures Vivian drew were messages from Purple Eyes, Mr. Squiggles. And I could deal with the spooky taunting if I didn't have to see the changes in Vivian. Her kid sister, Victoria, born a year after the incident, was the sweetest four-year-old in the world. Vivian doted over her and pampered her with affection. She was an anchor to the innocent and good side of the world. But I had witnessed her lash out in anger and slap her sister just days before. But, well, now I must bring everything back to the present. The reason why I'm back at this damned hospital. Two days ago, Vivian disappeared from her home. Victoria was gone with her. She'd left behind a single drawing on Victoria's bed. It was a picture of me. I wore a face of confusion and surprise. Behind me stood the stick figure with purple eyes, 
A word blew and came from its mouth. Who are you? It asked. I knew it was a call out for Mr. Squiggles. That's why I was on my way to the eighth floor again. Vivian would be there, and hopefully Victoria was still in one piece. Part 3 I wasn't even halfway up the stairwell when I encountered the creepy stick drawings plastered all over the walls. They stretched further down the stairway than last time, like a cancer on the building. But mixed in with the new drawing of purple eyes was a fat stick figure. It was drawn with a giant circle for a body with little heads and limbs sticking out, a yellow star in the middle of his chest. One picture had the fat man holding a tiny square with RX written on it. Another had the man hanging from a noose. Another was standing with a gun to his head. I seriously wondered who this stick figure was. I wasn't that fat. When I finally reached the eighth floor, I was hit with a terrible smell. It was like bad breath being blown in my face. It was so thick I could taste it. I gagged and had to get a hold of myself. The doorway to the floor was pitch black. No moonlight like last time. As I got closer, I realized there was an unnatural wall of darkness blocking the doorway. I stopped and considered my options. I didn't want to step into this fog, but I had to get to Vivian and Victoria. I remembered the picture of the angel of light being swallowed up by the darkness. Wouldn't I be essentially just feeding myself to this monster? As if sensing my doubt... A scream echoed from within the black curtain. A female scream. Victoria! Vivian! I shouted as I stepped closer to the threshold of the door. My mind was made up for me when a strong hand shot out of the gloom to grab my jacket. It pulled me into the thick darkness. For a moment, all I could see was nothing but the void. Then, in an instant, a fully lit clean hospital hallway jumped to view around me. I could hear the phone ringing and muffled sounds coming from the PA. I listened harder to make out what was being said. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He repeated over and over. I continued down the hallway and just like last time all the doors were open. Each door I passed I could see pale children staring at me with sadness in their eyes or curled up on the floor, crying to themselves. God, how many children had he taken? I was approaching the nurse's station when my surroundings changed again. I was standing knee-deep in water, and there was a circle of trees around me. In front of me, a one-eyed man hung from a tree sprouting out of the water. As I walked closer, he spoke to me. He lies. You can't deal with him. He will take and take. He will burn your soul right out of you. The man croaked, swinging gently. I guess Purple Eyes wanted a scene transition because I was suddenly sucked deep into the water. Down I went into the endless depths. All the air escaped my chest as I saw with my bubbles racing away from me. A mouthful of water tasted sour and burned in my throat. I coughed it back out, only to suck in more through my nose to scorch my brain. I knew I was going to die. I'd let purple eyes literally get into my body. But the worst thought was I didn't think I'd die like a normal person. Instead, I knew my soul would be blocked away as the monster used my body as a puppet to hurt people. I thought of poor Vivian, a girl who was a veterinarian's assistant and wanted to make the jump to helping people as a nurse. She had kindness and healing in her heart, all torn out of her for the past five years. Just as she was getting some semblance of hope back, that bastard took her again. And poor Victoria, oh, just a child. And Purple Eyes was going to have her loving older sister commit sororicide on her. A righteous anger filled me as I drowned in the burning water. My anger only grew as I choked. And with a thud and a wet splash, I fell to hit a stone floor with water splashing around me. I coughed and looked around frantically. 
All I saw were stone walls and a large metal door in front of me. The door was at least forty feet high and twenty across, covered with strange runes and symbols. I stood up and stared in wonder at it. I can help you escape, even with the symbol you have carved on your chest, came a booming voice. It was loud, but somehow comforting, like the voice of James L. Jones or Michael Clark Duncan. I can give you enough power for you to run. I don't want to escape, I said back with fear in my voice. I have to find someone. The girl, asked the deep voice. There was a measure of amusement in his tone. Now in my head I saw a vision of a giant man sitting in shadows on the other side of the door. His head was down and millions of feathers drifted lazily around him to fall and cover the floor. I felt a deep sorrow coming from him and a deep embarrassment. No greater love, spoke the voice. The figure lifted his head and his eyes burned a brilliant magenta. The whole room around me was blinding with the growing light coming through the door. A warm feeling passed through my bones. The world switched again, and I was back in the hospital for real this time. It was still run down and dirty, with moonlight coming through the windows. Now, I knew this was real, like how you know the difference between a vivid dream and actually waking up. It's... I had been freed, but there was no turning back. I was heading straight for the room, with the collage on the walls and the giant Mr. Squiggles picture. I heard a child screaming on the way. Sister, stop! Please stop! Victoria screamed. I turned the corner into the room to see Victoria's little body taped to a metal folding chair, her feet dangling. Vivian stood over her, cutting her cheek with a scalpel. Vivian, stop! I screamed. She turned to look at me and gave a big grin. She straightened and held the knife down by her sister's vulnerable neck. I had my gun in my holster under my jacket, but I didn't intend on shooting anybody. I reached to my back and pulled out a small tranquilizer pistol. It had cost me a pretty penny, but money wasn't an issue for me. I only had two shots. I'd have to draw fast and hit her in the neck for it to take effect quickly. In my pocket was a string necklace with a big charm bag on it. Madame Monroe had prepared it for me. It should cause an invading spirit to leave the body. I put it on her after I'd hit her with a trank. I just hoped it was strong enough hoodoo for this creature. As I was pulling the trank gun from my back, I felt an explosion hit me from the side of my face. The trank gun clattered to the ground as I spun around, dazed to see a man swing and hit me again. My vision went black for a second, and then it returned after another punch hit me. I should have known purple eyes would recruit another junkie for muscle. Now, I'd been a boxer back in college, and I knew the telltale signs my ass was about to be KO'd. So I ducked under another punch to come up with a one-two combination of my own. It stumbled my attacker back enough to get a good look at him. But it was Rob, my old partner. My heart sank as I saw the circles under his bulging eyes and dirt-caked face. How long had he been under its control? Why hadn't I kept better touch with my old friend? He must have spent hours at this cursed crime scene and talking to parking lot Will. Plenty of time for the torturer to get his hooks in him. I couldn't see him like this. No, I had to help. He stunned me again with another punch. He was taller than me and had a good reach. I took the next punch like a champ to get in close to him and grab him by the neck. He started hammering me in my stomach as I pulled my spare trank dart out of my jacket pocket. I stabbed it into his neck, and at first it had no effect on him. The blows kept coming into my abdomen, making my knees begin to buckle. But finally he slowed and fell to his knees. I left him dazed and rocking as I went to retrieve my trank gun. When I turned back round, I expected to see him on the ground, but he was stubbornly getting to his feet. He reached into his own dirty coat to produce a black Glock pistol. 
On instinct, I quickly pointed the pistol and shot Rob right in the solar plex with the dart. He grunted and continued to try to level the Glock at me, but his arm shook like the gun weighed a hundred pounds. I just shuffled forward and pushed him with both hands, and he went sprawling backwards to hit the wall and slide down unconscious. I ran over to him and bent to check on him, first grabbing his gun and tossing it into the hallway. His eyes fluttered and he moaned like he was trying to wake up. Ah, oh, damn it, I said, as I dug in my pocket to try and pull out the charm necklace. I was down both my darts and was about to use my trump card. But I couldn't let this thing have my old friend. I slipped the necklace over his head and he let out a gasp of pain began gritting his teeth as black smoke leaked out from beneath his teeth and nostrils. The dark smoke gathered in the air before shooting towards Vivian to go into her mouth and nose. Now, you watch, Vivian said in a terrible voice, though I knew her speaking was impossible. The Mr. Squiggle's drawing behind her began its twitching dance on the wall. She brought the blade back to Victoria's terrified face. I tried to move forward, but my body wouldn't let me. I was frozen somehow. My mind raced as I tried to come up with a plan. Well, I might be lying when I said the necklace was my trump card. Oh, I had another plan. A last-ditch effort. <laughs> Take me instead, I shouted. And just as I hoped, Vivian stopped and looked at me. You are fat and useless. Filled with hate and mistakes. Oh, but she's sweet. We are both sweet, said the thing talking through Vivian. Oh, then let one go and take me, I pleaded. I'd already figured even a tortured monster from hell still wouldn't want to be me, so I had to sweeten the bait for it to bite. What would hurt Vivian more? Me treading my life for her or her sister? Using me to kill one of them? I screamed in desperation. Whoever spared will live with that pain all their life. It'll punish them every day. Ah, oh, you wouldn't let me use you to kill one of the girls? The thing asked through Vivian. Yes, I said, my face in a mask of sadness. At least one will survive. I can't lose them both. Vivian straightened and gave me a hungry look. Then say it. Say you want me. I stand at the door and knock. Accept me into your heart. I gave a sigh of relief. Hopefully it thought it was a sigh of exasperation. I said the words. I welcome you into my heart. Take me instead. Ah, an ashen wave of black smoke shot out from her face into mine. It felt like I was drowning in burning water again. It continued to burn down my throat and in my lungs, reaching every part of me. Once it finally stopped, I felt pain screaming in every part of my body. It was an onslaught of maddening sensations. I tossed back and forth like an animal caught in a snare. It only stops if you hurt them, said a voice in my head. It was like the voice of the angelic man but it was twisted and sickly. Through a purple blur in my vision, I saw Vivian's face. She was terrified and confused. She looked down at her taped-up sister and bent over to start ripping it off her. Oh, you better be worth all that money, Madame Monroe, I thought, as I took a menacing step towards Vivian. I'd wired another five grand to her before showing up tonight. She should be in a dark room at this moment, performing her own counter-spell. The powder, Cher, the powder, came her voice in my head, and my hand went to the PI badge hanging around my neck. I put it out before me. A small vial filled with white powder was next to my dangling badge. I felt a sense of confusion come from the monster as I popped the cork and held it to my nose. You see, I had five years to plan for this showdown. I'd gone to great lengths to learn my enemy and protect the people I love. The powder I was about to snort was a special mixture of Monroe's. 
It was supposed to give me control back temporarily. I threw my head back and sniffed the whole vial. Oh, oh boy. Let's just say I found out cocaine was the main ingredient. It felt like fireworks were going off through my body, and my mind felt like a red-hot knife. Stay away, Vivian, I told her as I marched away from her. But I couldn't help it. I turned to look at both of them. Forgive your sister, Victoria, and take care of Rob. I began to tear up as I looked into her scared, beautiful face. I love you, Vivian. And with that, I turned and stormed off. I could hear Vivian crying after me. I was making it towards one of the rooms with a window. I pulled my gun out of my jacket and started to point it at my head. No! I felt the torturous voice yell in my mind. It sounded like it was far away, but, but still had the strength to make me throw my head away into the side. Checkmate, you purple bastard, I said as I angered my arm to point at the window. I shot the whole mag into the glass, shattering the window completely. I dropped the useless pistol and began marching toward the open window, taking big, heavy steps. Purple eyes fought me tooth and nail the whole way. When I got about five feet from the window, I felt the monster's panic. It started taking a different measure. I'll go back after the girl. All of you will still die tonight, it screamed in rage. There was a moment of calm as I felt purple eyes let go of me. Then his presence came back with a feeling of absolute confusion. <laughs> Check, mate, I said as I ripped open my buttoned-up shirt. Carved on my chest was a bloody ceiling and binding room, specially designed by the friendly madame. The bastard wasn't going anywhere. He was staying in this hunk of sentient meat the whole way down. Oh, I will kill her. I'll punish the whole family. I'll punish all of you. Only hell and torment await you in the end. I stood at the window and looked down. Madame Monroe said he would be bound to my corpse until the body was at. He'd be out of the game for a good number of decades. Enough time for the girls to heal and have a happy life. And so I stepped off the edge and felt the wind racing across my face. The monster screamed within me. Just a lowly burnt out P.I. against an angel killing horror of hell. <laughs> I smiled and thought. Let's go to hell together, you bastard. So that was the sequel, kind of, to a story I did a few weeks ago. Um, I did post it on the community tab uh, earlier today. So if you um, are a bit confused or you want to listen to a little bit more to flesh this story out, Go and check out that other story. Hopefully more to come, because I thought that was great. Really loved that one. What did you think? Thoughts? Feelings? Any kind of emotion you have, really? In the comment section below the video, please, and I'll just do my best, as ever, to reply to as many comments as I can. Now, whew, another long one for me, so I'm going to take a bit of a rest. But, of course, I will be back again. Maybe tomorrow on the second channel, but definitely here on Friday evening. You're going to join me, aren't you? Of course you are. But until then, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me, and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter... Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud, um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like, throw me a dollar or two, very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye bye.